I talked a little bit already about joy and how nobody can steal your joy. And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today is, is the idea of people stealing our joy. And, and I was reminded of the movie The Grinch. Kids, adults, we're going to take a break from Star Wars references and go to The Grinch for a second. Have you ever seen The Grinch movie? Does everybody, does everybody know The Grinch movie? Uh, I know it's not Christmas. I know it's cold and rainy, but it's not Christmas. In The Grinch... It's this unhappy, ambiguously something creature that is something and that, that is cranky and angry and he hates the joy of Christmas. And so he decides that the, what he's going to do, he is going to steal their joy. And so throughout the course of an evening with apparently weird working clocks, he goes to everybody's house and he takes their food, he takes their presents, he takes their decorations. He, takes, he tries to steal their joy because he thinks that's going to bring him happiness. But then in Christmas morning, obviously you know the story, they wake up and uh, they begin to sing their Christmas songs and he thinks he's stolen joy, but he finds out that joy is deeper than presents and things that can be stolen. And I find that story funny because on one level, most of us would go, how silly is that? Thinking you can steal someone's joy. Thinking you'll be happy by robbing happiness. Thinking that, that you can take away, like, an, like, how can you steal an emotion? Like, do you have a key? Do you have this trick to get inside? And so, so on one level, that doesn't make sense. Like, it's silly, to, uh, the idea that you can steal joy. But the truth is, most of us have experienced a stolen joy before. Just like me taking that present from Hannah. Some of us have had things in life happen. Bad news hits, bad grades hit, decisions that go the wrong way hit, and we might have had joy and all of a sudden that joy is robbed from us, it's ripped from us, it's gone. Maybe you, you know, we were talking about the Orioles and we're, we're celebrating a team that's just crushing it right now and after oh, so much pain, and, um, and so much hurt. But like, when our teams don't do great, it can, it can ruin your Monday when your football team loses on Sunday. Like there's joy that can be stolen there. And so a lot of our joy is circumstantial, situational joy. What I mean by that is as long as the world is working great, joy can be found and joy can be experienced. But if the situation changes, that joy is gone. If your joy is rooted in situations, it can be stealable. What we need is a better joy, a more complete joy, a, a deeper joy that is, that is unable to be stolen, that nobody can take away from you. Nobody, no Grinch can come into your life and steal your joy. And I know that sounds, this sounds cheesy, but the place where we find that joy is in Jesus Christ. I shouldn't say cheesy, that sounds churchy to say, you need a joy in Christ because I know a lot of Christians who struggle with that joy, who go, I know Christ, but I'm not really joyful. I believe in Christ, but my joy is a struggle. So when I say we need a completed joy that's found in Christ, already you're going, yeah, right. That sounds too good to be true. And the truth is this, we can find a joy in Christ, but we're gonna have to move beyond just the surface thought of Christ and really dive into an experience of Jesus that is deeper than our situations, that is deeper than just knowledge, but impacts our hearts that we've heard and we've seen and we've touched and we've lived out and we experience out within the body of Christ. So like basically we need to dig deeper because a joy can be found there. Joy can come in the morning as we sang about. We want to find this joy. So with that said, today we're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, the introduction. And by the way, if you're in one of our small groups, we are just kicking off a, a seven or eight week study through this book and these books that will help you kind of dive into this idea more. So if you want to get into a group, this is a great kind of preview for what John is talking about. But in these first four verses, John talks about what it looks like to have a complete or a completed or a deeper sort of joy. And this is not a normal passage for joy, but I think you're gonna see if we follow what he's talking about here, we can find a deep joy. So let me read these verses. 
He says this, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and what is revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now this is the key verse. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We are writing these things so that joy can be complete. And I want to look at these four verses and I want to show you how they lead up to this experience of John of complete joy. John is in the middle of prison right now or he's exiled. As he writes this book, he's, he's, kind of, he's been a pastor, he's been a leader, but he's, he's an older man now. He's in his 80s or 90s, maybe older. And he writes these things to his, to his disciples, to his churches. He's, he's, they, most people think he's in exile during this time on the island of Pathmos there. And so like he's... He's writing these letters to address false doctrine and trouble, but he's also writing these letters so that he experiences joy and we can experience joy too. So how can we find true joy, deep joy in Jesus Christ? Let me pray one more time and let's dive into this, um, let's dive into this passage together. God, we need joy. We need a joy that is not easily taken away from us robbed by mean dads <laughs> taking their gifts from their kids, but whatever, whatever that looks like in our lives, the Grinches that come along and try to steal our joy and sometimes succeed in stealing our joy. Show us a joy that is deeper and better and longer lasting and is sustained not just by knowledge of you, but by our experience and our longing and our activity and our fellowship with you. So help us to see how just as John wants a completed joy, we can find that completed joy too. Help us to see what joy can look like in our lives. Help us to understand this and live it out. And Lord, I pray for anyone struggling with joy, even though this is not a normal passage on joy, that they would see some of the foundational things in our lives that can help to build a better joy, a deeper joy, even on the days when joys feel so far away and struggle for us. Help us to find this joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So how can we find joy in Jesus? Um, the first thought is this. If you want to experience the joy of Jesus, you need to have an experience of the reality of Jesus. What I mean by that is you need to have an experience with Jesus to find the joy of Jesus. Not just some distant understanding of him, not just some come to church and, and sing a song once a week kind of understanding, but you've got to dig deep in a way that helps you experience Jesus and know Jesus and be impacted by the reality of who Jesus is. And I think verse one helps us see that. Here's how John starts his letter. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now that phrase, the word of life, that is not, that is not a title for Jesus. What that phrase is, is that's a, uh, an expression of the whole gospel, of the whole work of Jesus. It, it covers the whole scope of the good news of Jesus Christ, so this word of of life covers all the things that Jesus came to do, said, and accomplished on the cross. That's the word of life, the good news of the gospel. So John is writing about this word of life for you and for me. And I love the way it's called the word of life, because chances are you and I have experienced good words before. You've experienced good news, people who who are life-giving to you, that maybe you've been discouraged and somebody speaks a word of life into you. Maybe you're just struggling during this season and you get a card or a call that just, it's, it's a word of life in that situation. But the truth is, we need more than that. This is the word of life. This is the, the true word of life. This is the gospel. 
And this is the ultimate word of life. The gospel is the ultimate life-giving word and message for the world. This word of life is what we need. Now notice what it says here. It says that this word of life was from the beginning. From the beginning. That means that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, John is saying this is something we've heard from the beginning, we've, we've seen from the beginning, we've been around from the beginning. John is, you know, John, many, many decades past the time of Jesus, is saying this is the news, this is the message that we've heard and clung to, and it's been a part of our lives from the beginning. But even more than that, the news of Jesus has been true for for eternity. This is God's plan from before the world was started. John starts his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Meaning that this news of Jesus, Jesus himself, was, was around before John. This gospel was true before John, and it's still true today. The gospel is an unchanging message. What was from the beginning is the same gospel news. The word of life is the same today. You know, I don't know if you've ever been around, like, or ever wondered, like, how has the gospel changed? How has the Bible changed? How sometimes people think, well, the gospel needs to be innovated some, make it more palatable for for us to understand, make it easier. The truth is the gospel is unchanging. The news of Jesus does not change. And because the gospel does not change, it can change our lives. Because the gospel is the same yesterday as it was today, that the news is God's word, it's fixed, it's the work of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is unchanging, it has the power and the potency to change you and I. And so that's, that's, like, that's the power of the gospel here. But then look at, look at what happens here. This is what I really want you to see. I want you to see the way John describes his experience of Jesus and this word of truth. He says here, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This, this, there's, there's a progression here. We, we heard about it. This truth was told to us. We saw it like it was something we've, we've witnessed to. But then the word observed means we've studied it, we've examined it, we've explored it, and touched it. That's, that's actually the word that's kind of used. It's a, it's a word used of a blind person feeling an object, trying to determine what it is. That's the same kind of language here used. That if you were in the dark room and the lights were off, kids, and you're trying to decide what that thing is in your bed, which buddy is which buddy, and you're just feeling around trying to figure it out, that's the same word here. Like we've, we've picked it up, <coughs> we've picked it up, we've explored it, and we've, we've been in close contact with it. That's the experience here that John is talking about them having with Jesus. And it's a progression of getting closer and closer and closer until you're consumed and you're impacted by Jesus. I think about it this way. Who in here likes ice cream? Kids? Anybody like ice cream? Anybody ask your parents for ice cream every single day of your existence? Like it could be sick. Debbie's like, yes, I do. You know, that's a beautiful thing about being an adult. It can be 8.30 in the morning and you're like, yeah, it's time for ice cream because I'm a grown person and growing every day, apparently. Um, so, but I love ice cream. We, our family loves ice cream. One of my favorite ice creams is Jenny's ice cream. From, and and uh, we've had it first in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we heard about this place. So here, here's, notice the progression. We heard that Jenny's ice cream was amazing. Like we, we heard the rumors, the, the social media posts, like the conversations. We heard this is good ice cream. But then we went to the store and we're like, oh man, that looks like good ice cream, okay? That, not only have we heard that ice cream looks good, but when you, you see the ice cream, you're like, oh yeah, I could eat me a few cups of that. And then we observed the ice cream, you know, because you go into an ice cream place and there's like 15 flavors, you begin to kind of examine which kind of ice cream you want. But you don't stop there, do you? That's an insufficient experience. You don't just hear, you don't just see, you don't just observe, but you want to touch and taste and consume that ice cream. And so 
that ice cream exploration is not finished until there's a cone in your hand and it's dripping down and you, you got all of your goatee and it's, you're full in on the ice cream. And so bearded men, you know what I'm talking about. Or, or maybe your wives know more because you see it. But um, it's, a, it's the way to do it. It's the only way to eat ice cream if it's all over you. But that's, that's a picture here of how the disciples experienced Jesus. They heard the good news. They saw the power of Jesus at work. Like they witnessed his miracles. They saw him engage with the crowd. They, they, they pondered him. They observed him. They, they took in the truth. But at the end of the day, they touched this good news. They brought it up close and personal. And so you and I, if, if we want the joy of Christ, if we want to experience joy in our faith, a joy that is not stealable, then we've got to walk through this progression too. We can't just see Jesus. We can't just hear about Jesus. We can't just observe intellectually the God's word. At some point, we got to get in there and touch this and get it into our souls and experience Jesus in a way that shapes us and changes. We've got to get deep into this and we won't experience the joy of Christ from a distance. We've got to get into Jesus the only a full experience with the gospel, a full dive in of the gospel will bring this complete joy. You know the most, this is my personal preference, okay? You know the most miserable people at a beach? The most miserable people that visit the beach are those standing on the edge of the water because it's cold. You ever notice that? Like people that are like, they tiptoe to the water and they get their toes in. As soon as a wave comes, they're like, oh no, it's chilly. Like, that's, you must, those people must be the most miserable people in the ocean. You can hear it. You can see it. You can observe the waves. But you know the best way to experience the ocean? is to get in there and jump right in and swim around. At least that's my opinion. And that's, four out of, that's one out of five of our family would agree with that statement. But I'm just like, once you, once you get past a certain point, what's the matter, right? Just dive in. And I feel like some of us, we treat Jesus like that. We dip our toes in the edge of the ocean, but we're not willing to dive in fully with him. And if you want to experience the joy of Christ, it involves getting in the water, getting in, getting in the ocean and, and going deep with Jesus, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've observed, what we've touched concerning the words of life for you. And so joy is found in an, a deep, experience with the reality of who Jesus is, what he came to do, and the word of life. Now, here's the second way to experience joy. So if you want joy, dig deep with Jesus. Dig deeper with Jesus. Number two, the, another way to experience joy is to pass on the truth of Jesus. The second key here, and I really think John's getting at that when he says, we are writing these things so that our joy can be complete. He's really talking about the process of taking what you know about Jesus and passing it on to others so they too can find joy in Jesus Christ. Just like what Jordan was doing in New York City, taking the hope that you know about Jesus, and even though they're strangers, and even though it can be intimidating, and even though you're in New York City, taking the hope of Jesus Christ and passing it on to someone who doesn't have that hope yet, or helping someone deepen in that hope. And you see that here in verse 2, that there is joy found in passing on what you know about Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says this, that that life, the life of Jesus, the word of life, was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you. Notice that key phrase there. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have experienced, we also testify and declare and pass this on to you. We take this truth and we give it to you. And the two key words there are testify and declare. Both have a very similar idea. Testify means that you you are a witness, Christ has done something into you, and you bear witness to what he did. Declare is more of an announcement. We, we tell about it, we talk about it, we announce that this is available. So we, we are a witness and we announce this good news. And this is so key because here John is, 60 to 65 years past Christ. 
So he's, you know, this is, this is, this is multiple six decades, seven decades past Jesus. And you got to be, you got to think that there are probably some, some people when they hear the news of Jesus starting to go, yeah, right. Like, what's the real story? Like, what's the real scoop, John? Like, you were there. Like, I, we've heard that he rose from the dead and then he feed, fed 5,000 people and that, and that they, they threw down their cloaks and, and palm branches and that he, he turned water to wine. Like, we've heard these stories, but, but for real. But like, for real, what actually happened? And you guys know, like with kids, kids, you know this. Stories sometimes get interesting when you make up details. And uh, we've had kids, I'm not going to tell you which ones, but all of them have come to tell us stories. And like, we're like, that seems a little far-fetched. Did that really happen? And their option is to dig deeper into the far-fetchedness, you know, involve aliens and ghosts and Santa Claus potentially, like just, just really just keep going deep into the story. Or tell the truth. What really happened? Usually the exaggerated details are not the truth. And so you've got to imagine there probably is this thought, is this message exaggerated? And what John is saying, what we saw, what we heard, there's validity here. We are passing on to you, not made up stuff, not fictional things, not, not these stories and stories and exaggerations. What we're passing on to you is the truth of Jesus Christ. What we have heard, we're giving to you. It reminds me of what Paul says. In, uh, there's a validity here. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel, the word of life that I preach to you, which you have received on which you have taken your stand and by which you are being saved if you hold to the message I preach to you unless you believe in vain. Then verse three says this. This is the gospel. For I passed on to you, same language, that which is of most important that I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to the five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, then most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Do you see the truth in there, guys? I pass on to you this most important message, that Christ died, was buried, and on the third day, because the Bible says so, he rose again from the grave. And by the way, there are a whole bunch of people that heard about this. There are a whole bunch of people that saw this. You got Cephas, you got the 12 disciples, you got 500 people. And what he's saying is, go ask them. They saw him too. This is not an exaggerated story. This is the true story. And I'm passing it on to you. At the core of being a Christian, whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, at the core of following Christ, it's passing on this truth to others. And it looks differently when you're five. It looks differently than when you're four. Or it looks differently when you're, when you're 70 or 80 or 90. It, like we all have different relationships and conversations and, and circles, but that the core of following Christ is taking what we know and passing it on to others. I've been in Chick-fil-A play places where I've heard our kids telling somebody about Jesus for a Sunday school lesson up there in the slides. Take what you know and pass it on to others. That's the heart of following Jesus Christ. And you see this command. We could go scripture by scripture, but let me give you a couple. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 through 38 says this. He said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers People who will share and sow and spread workers into his harvest. Or how about Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20? Jesus came near and said to his disciples, this is after the resurrection, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you and remember I'm with you to the end of the age. The heart of the gospel, the heart of the command of Jesus Christ is to pass on what we know. How about Acts chapter 1, verse 8? We looked at this last week, right? 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you or has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So at the core of knowing Christ is a command to take what God has done, what you have seen, what you have heard, what you've experienced, what you've touched, what you've observed, and take that and pass it on to others. And so here's the harsh reality. Your joy in Christ is linked to your obedience of this command. Your joy in your faith Your joy in Christ, your satisfaction, the completeness of your joy is contingent on the activity of being a witness and a truth pastor that comes from what you know about Christ. The joy we have in Christ is linked to doing this. And you just think about how this looks. Like, it's it's one thing for you to be saved and and celebrate your salvation. You want to know a greater joy? When you see your children make those decisions. Like, I mean, the day you were saved, whether you were young or old, was probably one of the greatest days of your life. But man, when you see your kids make those decisions, isn't it even greater? Isn't it like, oh, you know, it's, and it's like a greater joy, a fuller joy. Or it's one thing for you to have a relationship with Christ. When you see your neighbor or, or your, or the stranger come to see that hope, it just, it just exponentially explodes your joy. And think about what that does. As you pass on your truth, it keeps you fresh. I guarantee Jordan and others came back fresh. Jordan is over. Yeah, there he is. Sorry, not Jordan. Jordan and others. I bet you when you shared your faith like that and others in your team shared your faith like that, it freshens your own faith. It revives your own faith. When you see and celebrate people coming to Christ, it solidifies your belief. It celebrates. It reminds you of your good news. Your faith is stronger when you pass this on. And not just the beginning of salvation, but even discipling others and mentoring others. Third John says this. Two letters later, uh, John says this. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Like there's not a greater joy in this world. Ravens winning, Oreos winning, the best barbecue you've ever eaten. There's, There's no greater joy. All those are secondary to seeing my children. He's talking about spiritual children here, walking in truth. The fastest way to a joyless experience of faith is to hold on to the truth of Christ like it's something private and for you only. Some of us are cold in our faith. Some of us are struggling with our worship because we've taken this amazing news that was meant to never stay with us. We've turned ourselves into a reservoir rather than a conduit. We've turned ourselves into the end point rather than just a throughway. Christianity is not meant to be a cul-de-sac. It's meant to be a highway. And so we're meant to continue to pass it on. And there's joy there. The gospel news will not bring a full experience of joy if it stops with you. So let's be about that work in whatever way you can. Let's invest the time. Let's, Let's grow in our knowledge if we need to. Let's address our fears, which are real, but let's pass that on. Now, here's the third thing as we wrap this down. We want to find fellowship through the unity in Jesus. I know these are simple points, but they're deep if you can get them. Experience the reality of Christ. Pass on the news of Christ. Then lastly, find fellowship through the unity of Christ. Notice how John finishes this letter. He says this. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John is sharing these things, sharing this book, talking about Jesus so that others will have fellowship with Him and so that others will experience the fullness of joy that is Jesus Christ within the fellowship. And this is so important for us. Because when you think about your friends, when you think about this church, when you think about community, a lot of times there are different things that unite us. Here in our church, we've got a ton of young families. And so sometimes life stages can, can unite us, can drive us together as friendships. Like when you got a newborn 
and you're just going through the fiery misery of a one-year-old or a sleepless nine-month-old or a teething four-month-old. Do they teeth at four months? I honestly blocked out the first five years of my kids' lives. But either way, like, if, we, if you're going through the, the angst of teenagerisms, if you're going through all these things, like, you tend to kind of flock together. You know, you feel my pain. If you go to the school, like, you tend to be close to kids that go to your school. You tend to, like, look down on kids that go to other schools. Um, life experiences, you like soccer, you like football, you like baseball, you like golf, you like those little, little miniature figurine things that you're coloring in your basement. Whatever it is, we tend to flock about those. So, so the truth is, we tend to build relationships based on hobbies and life experiences and things like that, but the gospel builds a better community. The gospel builds a deeper community. The gospel unites us in a way that is, that is far bigger than that. And the word for fellowship here, you know, sometimes churches have fellowship halls where they mostly eat in. Sometimes churches talk about fellowship dinners or fellowship nights. The word for fellowship is bigger than just party. It might be, party might be part of that, but the word for fellowship actually has roots in the idea of marriage or like close business partners. It has this picture of people that are in it together, closely linked, their success is built together. Their struggles are shared together. Their life is done together. Fellowship is a deeper sort of community than probably most of our friendships today outside of even the church. And even sometimes in the church, fellowship is this deep picture of togetherness. And the, the fact is, this church body, our church, should not just be a group of close buddies, but an invested family. That's what we're striving for. That's what we want. And yes, this is not because we're super good at being friends. Like most of us, I'm mostly pointing at myself, we're socially awkward, don't know how to small talk, and like we're weird. And we talk about Harry Potter or Star Wars or other things too much, right? So like nothing about us is going, oh yeah, we make really good friends. Like we're epic people. You know what makes us good and close in fellowship? Not our friendship worthiness, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. That brings us together. That unites us together. And there's something so critical here. When he says this, we pass these things on in verse 3. We declare to you so that you can have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. You see a priority there. If you have, because you have, a relationship and a fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, you can have relationships with other people. Because you have a relationship with God, you can have a relationship with others. The relationship with God comes first, and then you can have, and because of that, through that, you can have relationships with others. Because your relationship with God, it changes you. It builds you into the person who can love well, serve well, give grace. Because of Jesus Christ, you realize that you are a sinner and you are needy and you are messed up in a need of grace. And because of that, you can extend that to others and your whole community looks different because of that. If you put God first, community is better. But if you put community first, your relationships will struggle. God changes us through Christ in such a way that lets us have deeper fellowship with others. You can have friendships without God, but you'll never have this kind of fellowship. This comes because Christ has changed us, made us selfless. And yes, relationships are still hard and people still sin and there's still work to be done, but this kind of fellowship can bring us joy and gives us joy. I hope you know that fellowship starts with God. It opens by investing yourself in others and working toward it in the gospel. And so those three things, I know they sound super simple, like obnoxiously simple, but a full experience of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the mission work of Jesus Christ, and then the fellowship of the church will protect your joy, it will fuel your joy, and will help you experience the joy that can't be stolen. Rainy days can't take that joy away. Gift stealers can't take that joy away. Grinches can't take that joy away. I hope you know that joy in your life. I want to pray, and then I want to have a response time where you can just think about your own life. 
The truth is, though, this joy starts with Jesus Christ, a relationship with him. That this joy comes because you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that's a decision you've never made before. I want to encourage you, don't leave today without that joy. Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross for you and for me, was buried and rose again so that we could have joy, so that we could have this new life. To experience this joy, we believe that he's God's son. We believe that he came to die for our sins. We believe that he was buried and that he rose again the third day and we, we face our lives toward him. If that's a decision you've never made, there is joy in that decision of giving yourself to him. I'd encourage you to find that joy. He's our cornerstone. He's our foundation. We want to turn to him. So let's pray together. God.